Welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. If you're tired of all types of experts trying to tell you how to live your life, then welcome to this program because I think you're going to enjoy the people you meet today on Austin Faith Dialogue. We have three citizens of our community. We're going to talk to you about one of the most important dimensions of life, that of being a father. I'd like for you on the viewing audience of Austin Faith Dialogue to meet Craig Olson, an advertising executive here in the Austin area community. And also Tony Hernandez, who works in a maintenance position for one of the corporations of our community. And finally, I'd like you to meet Isam Bakir, a financial consultant. And we are pleased to have all three of you here on Austin Faith Dialogue to talk about what I consider to be one of the most important roles that a man could have in his life. You know, I don't believe I've had on any of the Austin Faith Dialogue programs as host a panel of people who are all male. I've usually had uh, females as well as males. And so I'm really uh, delighted to have you three here with me to talk about what it means to, uh, to be a father and how you live out your role as a father. Craig, uh, tell us what is, uh, what's exciting for you about being a father? I think the, the thing that comes to mind primarily is the pride that, that I and I think any father takes in his children when he sees them grow. And by growth, I mean not only physically, which is fun to watch, but emotionally as well. And when you see your children start to exhibit the same values, belief system, uh, the, the same things that you hold dear, when you see them start to mirror those same things, uh, that's important to me. Whether it's as simple as being kind to animals, uh, which is one of the things that my wife and I believe in very strongly. And then you see the, the kids start to treat anim animals kindly. How many children do you have, Craig? Two. How old are they? 17 and 15. So you're dealing with uh, two <clears throat> teenagers. A pretty exciting time to be a father, right? It is. We'll want to talk some more about that, what it means to be a father with teenagers. Tony, you have how many children? Two, sir. And how old are your children? Uh, one is five, and the other daughter is uh, two years old. That's great. Tell me, what's exciting for you in being a father? What's exciting for me, Carl, is um, the growth and the education towards my children and uh, seeing and experiencing as being a father and uh, raising two children. And sharing with them in that process of learning and, and growth. I saw him, you come from far away and that's one of the parts of this program that I certainly want those who are watching the program to find out about. It's a little bit of your background. You are a, what I call an international citizen. Tell me, uh, what's exciting for you in being a father? Coming home and uh, seeing a big smile, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> seeing children happy to see you, watching them grow and learn, um, interacting with them. It's, it's fun. It makes you feel young. You know, we talk in our society a lot about the significant others. <clears throat> and I think one of the most significant others in human development, and I'm certainly no expert on child development, but it has to be a father the role of a father, uh, the sacred writings of, of religions that we are a part of, they all speak about fathers and the role of father, and they even use the imagery of, of God being a father. Right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your fathers and, and the fathers you knew as you were growing up. And Craig, you grew up in the great upper Midwest uh, in the Wisconsin area. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little bit about your dad and some of the things that he gave to you. I think the thing I remember most about my father was the fact that he was always there. He was uh, a person that was not of many words, I guess you'd say, and there weren't, there weren't too many uh, lectures in learning from dad, but he was always there for the, for the kids. He was the type who would play basketball with, the, with us when we were teenagers out in the back lot and seemed to enjoy uh, teaching by example what was fundamental in his life. And those are the things that I know now. I didn't know it. I didn't know I was learning at that point. But those are the things that I'm passing on, I hope, and think to my children now. The simple things in life, honesty, uh, the, the things that mean a great deal in life, which to me are relationships with other people. You learn then from your dad. He was Scandinavian in background with a name like Olson. And sometimes That's those right. people, there are some exceptions like the two of us, but oftentimes <laughs> those Scandinavians are very 
few of words, right? But you learned from example in your dad. Uh, you lost him uh, when you were a young person? My dad died rather suddenly when I was 19, my uh, second year in college. And it was, it was sudden from the initial attack that he had, which was a, a cerebral aneurysm, to his death during surgery. And I didn't realize how much I would miss him at the time, I don't believe. There have been many times in my adult life that I wish he was here so that I could talk to him personally about some of the, uh, some of the problems, some of the stresses, some of the, some of the things that we're going through now. And we can talk about it in terms of the 80s and 90s, but I imagine the stresses we feel are very much the same as our dads felt in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And to get that type of feedback uh, from him would, would have been very valuable to me. But in his absence, I have leaned toward older male friends of mine, my employer, people that have uh, father images for me. Mm -hmm. And that has been extremely important to me in a, in a uh, support system is people that I find either at the church, in work, neighbors, peers, to find out you're not the only one experiencing these I think problems. Craig has raised an interesting point that maybe Tony, you and I saw him want to pick up on that the, the title father is not necessarily given only to people who are biological fathers, those who procreate children, but also father and that title of father and the privilege of being a father is given to people due to a variety of circumstances in our lives. Craig right. mentions about his father dying and looking for uh, another man in his life, an older man, to somewhat be a, a father image to him. Tony, I know that you as a, as a youngster went through um, the, the trauma of a divorce in, in your life. Yes, sir. You were uh, very young and uh, another man came into your life uh, as a stepfather. Uh, what were some of the things that you as a child of five years of age dealing with with the reality of divorce uh, what were some of the feelings and things that you had at that time as you can remember and then what did your stepfather do for you well Carl as I can remember uh, it wasn't a very happiness for me because at the age I was I didn't understand what was really going on mm -hmm. but uh, what my stepfather did for me was to realize that he was there for me when I did need him. And as growing up as a teenager, I didn't understand that. And that was uh, really hard for me to understand that what he wanted was to give me love and to understand him as a father. Mm -hmm. And to this date, I uh, really respect him as a father and not a stepfather. So as you, as you think in terms of those titles of father and stepfather, you've kind of put those together. And I think for those people in our viewing audience who are playing out that type of role in a family unit of being a stepfather, that they hear a sense of affirmation from someone like you who's experienced yes, that, that if they take that seriously, that responsibility, right. that there are youngsters like you only a few years ago were a youngster, they can sense that, that unity and that family spirit yes, that sir. evidently your stepfather did for you. Yes, sir. I saw him, you had a different experience. You grew up in Lebanon. Right. Uh, is that halfway around the world or all the way around the world? Well, three quarters of the way around the world. <laughs> <laughs> and you grew up in the village of Sidon, Lebanon. Is Sidon. That, well, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. It's an old city. I was uh, growing in Tyre before that. Tyre is a little bit older. We played around the wall that was built by Alexander the Great at that time. There was a lot of history. Amazing. And I was growing in Sidon, where we have a fortress built by the Phoenicians some 3,000 years ago, rebuilt by the Romans. And I used to spend a lot of time there studying. So there's a lot of history. Um, our traditions in um, stress, uh, respect for the elderly, your uncles, aunts, older people. Mm -hmm. um, there is commitment to the family. I think you mentioned to us, before we went on the air with the program, some of the story that was a part of your legend of how parents treat the older members of the family and how youngsters learn. That's Tell right. that legend, that story again. Well, basically, it's about some parents who were not very good to their parents, which means to the grandparents of the child. And because they broke a lot of plates when they uh, sit at dinner, uh, they're too old. Uh, their children then, or the parents, uh, gave them some wooden plates to eat from. But one time the father came and saw his little child working with a wooden piece. He told him, what, what are you doing? 
said, I'm doing a wooden plate for you when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> they learn from example, is they what you're saying. They learn from example, and so we are told you respect the elderly because one day you're going to be old, your children will respect you. You know something, Isam, that's very interesting, that you in Sidon, Lebanon, would have parents who made that type of statement to you because I grew up in the Olympic Peninsula in the state of Washington, and I had parents out of a Swedish Lutheran background who told me the very same thing, be kind and good to the elderly because someday you're going to be there. <laughs> be there. And I'll never forget those lessons that my parents modeled for me in terms of what it means to care for people of, of all ages. Um, Tony, you have two little girls. Yes, sir. And I think that maybe their picture can go up on the screen, possibly, and we can see those two beautiful little girls, five and two, right? Yes, sir. You, are, you have as a value education. Uh, how do you model for them uh, what it means to be involved? Education is important in our society. It's yes, one sir. of those uh, keys to opening the, uh, the future, right? Right. How do you model for them? the importance of education. As a father, what do you do? How do you get involved? Do you say to your wife, you take over the teaching of the kids? What do you do? Well, sir, I, I sit down with them and I try to explain to them what education can bring to them in the future. And I know my daughter is young, but I take the time out of my planned uh, day to uh, give them the knowledge of what I know and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, what they can become of themselves and I really enjoy doing that because what I missed out from my real father and my stepfather showing me as in um, realizing what I, what I can accomplish for myself. Does and your I, daughter ever ask you, uh, that five-year-old, she goes to T.A. Brown School, right? Yes, sir, she does. Does she ever say, Daddy, why, why do I need to learn this? Yes, sir, she does. <laughs> and how do you answer that? I, I, the way I answer is um, we, need, we need the education so that way we can accomplish more than what uh, we have for ourselves now. Well, I think what you're saying is that there needs to be some sort of accountability, you know, right. and you're teaching her that. That's important. You have expectations for her and that you want her to know that there are expectations yes, in the family life. I saw him in Sidon, Lebanon. Did your father, what, what did he do? What was his uh, livelihood? What did your father do? Uh, my father had an office job. Uh, he did a lot of uh, work where he had to... Uh, go out and see people uh, with the United Nations actually, relating to United Nations, and uh, people who needed help um, in education and other means. Mm -hmm. But he stressed education, he wasn't ed well educated himself, so he stressed education very, very strong to us. And uh, that's the mo one of the most important values he put in us. You know, you mentioned to me, and, and you also have pictures of your uh, children, and your two boys are how old? Five years and one year. And I think we can probably put their pictures on the screen also for the, uh, the people who are viewing to see those uh, two handsome young men of yes. your family. But you mentioned that you like to have them to uh, have lots of uh, reading material. Isn't that right? Talk we a little get, bit we about We get them a lot of books and all the time like uh, we probably spend on books and magazines for them as much as I spend for me and I love reading uh -huh. and I belong to a lot of publications we read uh, to the elder boy five years old every night my wife and I would read to them to him now the little one will sit in his crib and watch us uh -huh. <laughs> and, <have> watch. <laughs> and he'll hold the books and play with them right. and sometimes we play, we play like we're reading to him so they love reading I think you are building what I call a uh, healthy family life. <clears throat> and I think it's important for us in our society because, you know, we do have a crisis, if you will, and I don't want to over-dramatize that, but we have a crisis in family lives, and we need to help people to recognize uh, the privilege of having family and the work that goes in the family. And that's one of the goals of Austin Faith Dialogue and one of the reasons that, that we wanted to have this kind of program, to bring, bring people like you three here to say that I enjoy being a father and it's a privilege to be a father. Craig, uh, how do you spend time? You, you have active teenagers and that's a little bit different than sitting down and reading to them. They may not want to read anymore with you, but what are some of the things that you do with them to, to maybe have some special time with your, your teenagers? Well, it's true. Seldom do we sit down and, and have me or uh, Barb read to the kids anymore. And it's much more difficult as they get older to find the, the quality time or the time that you'd like to spend with them. Mm -hmm. There's too many distractions. There's telephones and televisions and, and all of that tends to get in the way. One of the ways that my daughter and I have found to spend time together, my wife as well, but often Kim and I will go for a walk at night. 
and she seems to enjoy it, uh, maybe not as much as I do, but uh, she enjoys that, and it gives us 50 minutes of time that we'll not hear a phone ring and we'll not hear a television set, and some of the special time is spent in silence. Mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you don't need conversation every, every minute of the walk. And sometimes there's just there's uh, special moments in silence. Some nights the the walks are filled with conversation and what's happened and what does this mean and uh, things to be aware of. We just let the conversation take its normal course. Um, Scott and I, my son, now and then will take the skeet machine with our shotguns and and clay pigeons, and that gives us the time to go off together and do something, spend time together. Sometimes there's uh, conversation, and sometimes there's not, but there's just uh, some of the most intimate moments and some of the most memorable, I hope, for my children will be the same as they were for my father and, and me. Seemingly insignificant moments at the time tend to be the most remembered, as I mentioned before with my father and his playing basketball with my teenage friends and myself. At the time, it was kind of... Uh, it was interesting to have a 50-year-old man play basketball with us, but it didn't have the, it didn't have the meaning that it does to me now. I remember I can remember the the details of those basketball games, and I never thought I would. Precious to, moments. They they are, and they they come spontaneously, and they come often without planning. But to it's been important to me the, the walks and the special times have started just during the past year, so uh, I maintain that it's never too late to start special things no matter how old your children become. I just turned around and they're 17 and 15. They're, <laughs> they're only supposed to be about 8 and 5 in my mind. Sure. And uh, it's, that's, it's been That's overnight. why every day, every day is kind of special and holy and sacred and make the most out of every day. Craig alluded to something and that's the busy schedules. You know, you, three of you are hardworking people and you have busy schedules and uh, when they get to be teenagers the phone rings and school activities and you know now even with the little ones that you're very busy and going different directions. Your fathers of the 1990s, the last decade of, the, of this uh, century, what about the pressures? What kind of pressures do you have on, and what do you see fathers of the 1990s uh, struggling with and dealing with and trying to balance their schedule and their time? I saw them. What are some of the busy things, and what are some of those pressures? It's, it's very busy time-wise, but uh, you'll have to make some quality time. Uh, that's what I try to do. Try to go to the park, um, uh, bike riding, running. Um, it's very hard to balance it, but we have to work at it. I saw you come out of the Muslim faith tradition. Okay? That's right. What did your dad do? He was a busy man. You mentioned tonight on the program that he was with the UN and worked for the UN office there in Sidon, Lebanon. What, what did he do to spend time with you? Do you recall events? He sat like quietly on the balcony, talking. You didn't play basketball over there, is that right? No, we didn't. All right. Did you play any <laughs> games together? We didn't play games, no. But got a little bit older we played backgammon together we played uh, cards together right but not uh, sport games he used to play uh, soccer uh, I, I played soccer with the younger kids so he wouldn't play with us no. do you think the most pressing issue then facing fathers in the 1990s is time to time, find time? time is the most important thing these days well, Tony what do you think what's I've got another thing I want to bring up another idea but Tony what do you think what's the most pressing issue facing fathers in the 1990s what's the stress all I feel, Carl, is uh, having uh, to keep uh, family together. Mm -hmm. It is so difficult now in the 90s, and uh, the way the crises are, is it is hard to keep a family happy. To keep them unified and happy and together <clears throat> and to meet the needs of the family members. Yes, sir. Craig, what do you think is the stress? Travel can be a stress. That, that is often demanded upon uh, business people today. And it was something that I had to deal with about 15 years ago, just about the time we came to Austin. One of my jobs dealt with travel probably 30 or 40 percent of the time. And it was during that time that our first child, Scott, was born. And it was also then that I realized that I didn't like raising children by long distance. And I, I didn't care to come home after a week or two on the road. And see that they had physically changed and I was missing something there and that was one of the uh, happy opportunities that uh, moving to Austin brought was to take a job that involved less travel uh, one of the other 
stresses of life, of course, is financial. There are so many burdens uh, mm -hmm. to whether it's keeping up with the neighbor or whether it's uh, so often it's that. I think we look around and th see the things we think we should have. Mm -hmm. We we should ourselves, mm -hmm. and then there's that desperate attempt to uh, to get the means to buy the things that we want. And uh, there too, I I realize that. And every once in a while, often I step back and realize what's important. It's the family, it's the relationships, it's the people that you interact with. Not new cars, not new houses, but the, uh, the, the people around you. I, I hear you saying some of the same things. I hear you talking about the stress of time on you as, as people who are working people, professional people. I hear you talking about the struggle of keeping the family unified. And the people watching the program today, they know about all those kinds of stresses because they're dealing with it just like you are in the front lines. And I right. hear you talking about financial and travel and all those kinds of things. But I think that there is, a, is another stress, and I think that's a, that's a spiritual stress. How do we put into all of these uh, questions we have and all of these realities we live with in the 1990s, how do we put some of the um, spiritual realities, Craig mentioned relationships, how do we hold those up as being important for our children so that they'll know to, to care for the elderly is an important value in the life? How do you go about, what are resources for you to go about helping the children to know that life is a spiritual experience. What I saw, what are some of the resources? You mentioned reading, and certainly education is that, but are there any other resources that people might look towards? Well, knowing about God, knowing there is God, and uh, what God wants people to do in order to be happy, be good people, mm -hmm. help one another. And that's very important, I think, for a parent to instill some moral values in their kids early. You can't shrink that responsibility, you can't leave it to the schools or anybody else. If you don't tell them when they're young what's right and what's wrong, how to love one another and help one another, nobody else is going to tell them. You know, you have a very interesting thing you can mention to the viewing audience because you were raised Muslim. Beverly, your wife, was raised Christian. How do you, raising your two sons, how do you go about holding up? We live in a pluralistic society. Uh, uh, the Olsons, they were the same religious denomination, background type of, so they had that going for them. But you didn't. How do you go about helping people who have a marriages where one is of this faith tradition and one is of that faith tradition? Be open-minded about it. Ah, good. <laughs> that's, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, God and religion is a private thing. God is there. Uh, we believe in Him, but the details of it is very private. I don't see much difference anyway between the major religions. I'm not specialist in religions, mm -hmm. but I know a lot about the Christian, the Muslim, the Jewish religion. I see very little difference uh, between the three religions. So what you're saying is affirm one another's religious heritage, That's right? right? That's don't right. try to put it down. That's right. Tony, how do you, uh, uh, Isam's point about religion being a, a private matter, uh, you come out of a Roman Catholic tradition. Yes, what about uh, the community? How do you see the, uh, the church community as being a resource? Well, sir, the church community resource is, um, it's there for everybody. And uh, if you would like to find out what it's about, then... Uh, Take the children there? Yes, sir. We, well, we, uh, as a family, we do go as a family, and we, we really enjoy... Uh, Worship together, worship. that type of thing. Yes, sir. And fellowshipping and that type of thing. Yes, sir. Craig, how about you? How do, how do we deal with those stresses in life from, from the point of view of our spirituality? You are three spiritual men, and I know that about you. But how do you deal with those kinds of stresses to put it in the context of, of faith and, and God and trust? And Sometimes I think you have to, you responsible to plant seeds with your children. Mm -hmm. They may not... Uh, understand what the flower will look like eventually, but uh, one of the rituals or the things that we do as a family is to go to church. And I think as children get older, that at times becomes harder to do because they tend not to understand what the value is. Why do we have to go to church? Why do we have to go today? Uh, because that's what we do as a family. Because I have learned already that uh, I felt the same way you did 20 or 30 years ago. And it has come back to me, the seeds that my parents planted with me have come back and have grown now, and I can see how important developing this relationship, developing your faith and your spirituality is. And it's a matter, I think, of, uh, with me, it's, as it was with my dad, is to try and teach by example. There are many ways that you can teach your children 
that to me what it's all about is making this a better world for other people. I've got to ask you one last thing. We're about ready to wrap up Austin Faith Dialogue for this week, but I wanted to ask you something. You've enjoy, you enjoy being fathers, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But yes. we need to tell people in the audience, have you had disappointments in being fathers? Have your children disappointed you? <laughs> huh? Sure they have. Yes, yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. And, and you, how do you deal with that? Really quickly. Craig, how do you deal with the disappointment? The same way they, they deal with the disappointment in their parents, I imagine. They realize that we're human, that we're fallible. I realize they're human and fallible, and we forgive. We learn, you know, most of us learn as much from our mistakes, perhaps, as we do from the, the positive things that we do. Tony, you agree? Yes, sir, I do. Yeah. How about it, I saw? Be positive about it as much as possible and move on. How about telling them that you love them, you know, even That's when they disappoint them? That's right. Always we always, always, always do. Important. Important. Tell them you love each other. Very important. I would like for you in the Austin Faith Dialogue viewing audience to look at your screen right now and concentrate because I have a, a little message that I want to share with you in closing. I thank you, Craig and Tony, and I saw them so much for being here, but I've kind of summarized what I think a father of faith might suggest to his children, and I'd like you to listen as I share this with our viewing audience. A father of faith communicates and listens. A father of faith supports and affirms. A father of faith teaches respect. A father of faith develops a sense of trust. A father of faith has a sense of play and humor. A father of faith exhibits a sense of shared responsibility. A father of faith teaches a sense of right and wrong. A father of faith has a strong sense of family in which tradition and rituals abound. A father of faith has a religious core. A father of faith teaches service to others. And a father of faith fosters family table time and conversation. Thanks for being with us on Austin Faith Dialogue. Blessings to all of you. For more information, call Austin Metropolitan Ministries at 472 76